well. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I think we can start. Is uh, Professor yeah. Najib Azad here? We are, we are going live. Just a minute. Yeah, I'm Just here. Minute. I'm here. Mr. Krishna, you will have to tell us when to start, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a minute. We are going live. Just a minute. Okay, fine. Fine. Namaste and good afternoon. I welcome you all on behalf of Sahitya Academy and uh, Foundation of Sark Writers and Literature uh, to the second session of this South Asian Online Literary Conference. Uh, in this session, we have with us uh, Dr. Mamang Daiji, distinguished writer, uh, to chair this session. Then Professor Ashish Nandiji, Ms. Neelam Saran Gaurji, then Mr. Subodh Sarkarji, and uh, Mr. Azad as well. I'm happy uh, that uh, Ajit Gaur, madam, also with us. And uh, since inaugural session, she has been with us all through. So heartily welcome you all again to this session. Uh, in this session, we will have paper presentations as well as fiction readings. So uh, with the permission of the chair, first I invite Ms. Neelam Saran Gaurji to read out from her fiction. All the respected uh, distinguished writers, uh, writer participants are requested to take not uh, take uh, more than 12 minutes to make their presentations. Neela Saran Gaurji. Ji. Professor Ajit Nandi has to give his keynote address. He is the first. Am I audible? Can you hear me? Professor Nandi has to give his keynote. Yeah, Krishna Ji. Ajit Kaur, ma'am. Your... Professor Nandi has to give his keynote address. Oh, okay, okay, fine, fine. Fine. Okay, fine, fine. Fine, fine, fine. fine. Right, right. Fine. Uh, following uh, Ajit Kaur, ma'am's instruction, I request uh, Sri Ashish Nandi Ji to first. Uh, Deliver his keynote address. Hearty welcome, Ashish Nandiji. Please unmute yourself. Thank you very much. It will be welcome, sharing my thoughts with you. Uh, originally, this was supposed to be a keynote in the morning. Unfortunately, it clashed with this serious meeting of the board of the institution where I work and I had to be there. But it doesn't matter. I can abridge my thoughts um, and confine myself to something like 12 minutes like everybody else will do in this session. My presentation will center around three basic themes and their interrelations. Freedom, visions, and creativity. I am a psychologist. I am not a writer in your sense of the term. I function as a psychologist and a sociologist, and I study human beings which may, should be of some interest to all of you. My interest particularly is in human creativity. For many years, I studied it professionally. And in the future, I am a futurist also. Now, I come straight away to the point. What is freedom? There can be many definitions of this. From 
definitions from our constitution, but there can be definitions by poets. My newly published miscellany begins with an epigraph from the Chinese poet, well-known Chinese poet, Be Dao. And that epigraph is very simple. Freedom is, his definition of freedom is very simple. Freedom is a distance between the hunter and the hunted. <laughs> so now, this is a simple, apparently simple description, but we also know that it has, it carries profound meanings. And I will like to speak briefly on some of the subtle communications that go on in the world of creativity between those who create and those who consume the creativity or recognize it as creative. Okay. The great moments Creativity do not come when the creative writer, I have in mind mainly the poets, musicians, and thinkers. By thinkers, I don't mean professional philosophers, but I mean deprofessionalized philosophers who, whose socialization under a discipline is less than complete. And therefore, so they have a freedom which trained philosophers do not have. So this is something uh, is in, in, uh, which we have to recognize that creativity, great creativity comes from people slightly under socialized by whatever be the discipline. Now the great moments of creativity are those not when somebody like Subhasar Karam, who is a poet, think and construct and produce Karba, his work. Great moments are of there when the creative person, in whatever field it might be, is falls under the control of his own writings. When the product of creativity, the creative process takes over the control from the creative person, you are not writing poetry or, or composing music, you are being composed through, you are being written through. And these are the moments which produce great poetry, great music, great thought. This is the first proposition I make to you. And this also means, I again point out to the fact that this letting go of control, inability to control your own products, own creative process, and being controlled to your creativity is something which comes once in a while. You cannot plan it, you cannot control it, and nor can you take full responsibility for the production. You, you will, previously, people will say this was a blessing from divinity. I was blessed by my God or Goddess to write this, produce this kind of work. I cannot do it by myself, that you used to say. Now, if we do not want to bring in the divinity into our game, I will still say there is something called inspiration which comes not only, not only from within you or your unconscious, that also comes from your surroundings, your 
ways of relating with the world, other human beings, and the experience of your life, which you do not always know. Your unconscious partly takes over and has a play which you in normal life can, do not like to admit. And, but you, if you are a poet or a musician or an artist, you somehow in the heart of arts know that that is, that is something which uh, you have no very little control on. This also means that if you do not have that control over your writings, at least your greatest writings, nobody else truly, whether he is a person or she is a, she is a uh, man, woman, parents, critics, the, even the state and the politicians cannot, cannot be given the right to determine how much freedom that particular person should have or not have because it is not only a product of that person, but there is also there behind it, the collective experience and collective yearnings of a community or a culture or, a, or even a civilization sometimes. It is with that part of the story, I should be concerned here. So I, in, in the few minutes that I have, I will give you an example of that. So that what I am saying becomes clear to you. Quite some years ago, I had read a small essay almost forgotten now by the Bengali writer Pramothanath Bishi. They say in Bengali title, essay's Bengali title was Rovindra Sahitya, if I remember it correctly, Gandhi Choritre Purva Vahash. Hmm. Anticipation of a Gandhian character, characteristics in Tego's writings, I should say in his early part of his life. The strange part of the story is this, that Tegor, when he wrote this, essays, poems and plays. There are some plays also reflect that, that those characters come in. None of them, he had, before writing, at least most of them, to the extent I have to trace them, were written after Tagore had heard of Tagore or heard of somebody called, sorry, Tagore heard of somebody called Gandhi or even heard of it from somebody else. It is sui generis. In fact, my feeling is that nobody at that time had heard of Gandhi. It was that early in Tego's life, in many of the writings. Now, where from this ability to anticipate a person who you feel will be will emerge as a as a liberator? of your people and whom you welcome through your poetry, songs and in place. This remains a mystery. How do you get this vision, not this vision? Technically speaking, if I will allow me to use a little bit of technique. 
jargon here. Freud talked of something called Ego's anticipation of Gandhi was an uncanny thing, a bizarre thing. But Freud's definition was a little different. Freud's definition was this, that uncanny, that event is uncanny, that dream is uncanny, which or that he also talked about a dream ego in this connection, which was further elucidated by the famous Sri Lankan uh, anthropologist, uh, Gononath Obesekere. But that's a different story I will touch upon. The uncanny means is actually a familiar thing, which for some reason is censored by your unconscious mind, but which comes off in strange guises to bypass the unconscious. I would like to modify this to some extent to say that in the case of creative artists and writers, this avoidance and bypassing that repression comes because they have the special capacity for what Freud would have called sublimation. So they can handle their aggressive and sexual drives much better you know, through sublimation rather than a censorship and struggle with it. But that's not important for me. Uh, for you, paid by way of elucidation of that how it can be looked upon. The concept of dream ego also comes in because this vision which Tagore had of Gandhi like character or also is a very typically um, interesting uh, thing because we have produced a lot of visionaries even in the 20th century as late as that. And these visionaries had visions which many people rejected as irrational, totally meaningless, and basically something which is forgettable. But Gananath Obeseke's book, he has applied these same principles to Buddhist visionaries as well as theosophists to show that there is also there something more. Because dream, which is supposed to be relatively free of control of ego, primarily driven by our unconscious is not only a product of the unconscious, but also an autonomous ego, which is not under your control. Ego stands for I, yourself. So yeah, in dream, you do not con control the images you see in the dream. Your unconscious controls it. But Sometimes, in, indirectly, the ego also gets involved in patterning the dreams and the visions. So in some ways, what they are saying in dreams may not be our concept of rationality, our concept of the real world, but nonetheless has a symbolic meaning to convey. And the that visionary visions is accessible to other people. I hope this is not too complicated. I would like to end by saying that if Tagore's vision of Gandhi-like characters before the emergence of Gandhi in India's public sphere reflects also a different kind of anastomosis intertwining that he as a poet had sensed within him without he was not a professional 
student of sociology or uh, culture or uh, anthropology or uh, psychology that without it intuitively guess not only the deep sense of humiliation, defeat, and consequence such for dignity attempt to find from within yourself a new kind of liberator who will lead with a, from a worldview which is accessible to you, not only to scholars, scholars, so to speak. And that yearning, which is not accessible to the ordinary person, can be accessible to great poets, musicians, and great thinkers who are under socialized. They are not historians. No? They are, they are uh, no, not sociologists. They are not sociologists. They are not anthropologists. But that yearning, that uh, search for dignity, and that uh, sense of search for a, a new kind or new symbol, living symbol of your culture, who will promise you, it, at least strive for you, for another kind of liberation, where the instruments of liberation, well as categories used in defining the liberation, accessible to you. It is that conjunction between and a uh, no, uh, mute multitude whom we can only call people. You cannot identify individuals in the crowd. And a gifted creative genius only can have a kind of vision they would have. Thank you very much for your patience with this peculiar presentation. I hope it makes some sense. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ashish Nandisat, for your brilliant keynote. Thank you. Thank you. Now, with the permission of the chair, I invite Ms. Neelam Sharangaurji to present her readings. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Can I be heard? Yeah. Uh, first of all, let me thank Chief Kurji for inviting me to this eminent gathering. We are going to use each other and produce ourselves in uh, as brief as possible. So I will do it. My name is Neelam Sarangor. I'm the author of six novels, four collections of stories, and two books of nonfiction, and a translation of one of my own novels. I have been an active book reviewer and columnist. My latest novel, Requiem in Rag Janki, won the Hindu Fiction Prize for 2018. I work as professor in the University of Allahabad. I'm going to read back from one of my recent books titled Allahabad Aria. The name of my city was changed recently as book is an ode to the Allahabad that was. It's about my city, and I shall be reading from a story about Allah and their own stories and aspects. The passage is a narrative about enter common in a legendary coffee house in which strong arguments break out and epic language battles take place. Two citizens engage in a highly comic exchange in which history is rewritten with great authority and conviction. And the power of the editorial pen is asserted over mere amateurs like Kalidas and Shakespeare. Such is the towering confidence of the native Allahabad. Uh, that's just a little bit about what I'm going to read. 
The above narrative so charmed the sippers of coffee and consumers of dosas that it inspired a spirited discourse from one of our university dons. Now everyone takes pride in the fact that our Allahabad University was once called the Oxford of the East, though lately they have been perverse dissenters who are given to citing the insulting detail that Mahatma Gandhi mischievously had the four that G.D. Birla gave him harnessed to an ox and called it his ox ford. That one had only to look and behold the vine jumping their fodder, swaying in herds, unmindful of heavy traffic, blessing the streets with fulsome benediction in steaming cow paths. Still, argued the university don, there was no getting away from lineage, the bloodlines of an institution, the ghosts, ah oh yes, the ghosts of its great glorious past. He had personally devoted years of his life working on a learned project, Ghosts in the Works of William Shakespeare. Now this William Shakespeare, much beloved of Allahabad University's English dons, had fallen under suspicion of having a ghost writer. Oh, all the back, Marlowe, Bacon, Mary Sidney, Edward de Vere, etc., etc., until a piece of laborious research revealed the truth Shakespeare wrote the works of Shakespeare. But pursued our coffee house, Don, what nobody knew all along was that it was an Allahabadi who had actually written the works of Shakespeare, who had been Shakespeare's ghost writer for years, our very own Pandit Dean there. Now we all know that when Indian metaphysics, mathematics, aesthetics, what have you, were touching the stars, the bricks were painted blue and running down their windows and moors with harpoon and hatchet. Everything they ever learned or produced came from the sacred East, including the works of Shakespeare, rightly the works of our Pandit Deen Dayal. Akbar's time it was, Queen Elizabeth I on the throne of England. All of us have read that the Virgin Queen received offers of marriage from the houses of Spain and France. But few know that she received a proposal from our gallant Akbar too. The idea, as records establish, was Birbal's. The great Mughal sent a Kashmiri carpet to the Virgin Queen, and when it was unrolled in her court, presso, there appeared neatly packed with that Sanskrit scholar par excellence, that astrologer magnifique, that palmist without peer, Pandit Deen Dayal of Prayag, renamed Ilahabas by Akbar. Pandit Deen Dayal spoke 37 languages and wrote in 40. He promptly proceeded to advance his monarch's marriage proposal and sought to read the Virgin Queen's palm and plot her horoscope. What he read therein grieved him. The Virgin would remain a stubborn spinster, a cussed feminist. And so the great Mughal who dreamt of a mighty union of cultures might as well perish the thought. Pandit Deen Dayal dared not return to Ind to break the bad news and had to be put to some use. Fortunately, a scriptwriter at the playhouses of London, Will Shakespeare by name, talent spotted him and found in him the inspiration to write of the Moor in Othello, Shylock in The Merchant of Venice, and Caliban. And he discovered in himself a growing fondness for ye olde English ale, and an increasing frequency of visitations from the muse. If you read between the lines and a little to the left of the lines, you see his ghostly shanty seeker posing. His one regret was that he'd have to be buried, not cremated, when he'd finally shut his mortal coil, a consummation devoutly to be avoided. But after the death of death, his death, his loyal friend William Shakespeare contrived to enlist the services of a horde of witch hunters, having convinced them that palmist, stargazer, and horoscope plotter that he had been Panditji was an eminent candidate for the stake. They dug up his grave and set his remains alight 
that being the civilized practice in Europe with all who were dangerously left wing. His ashes flowed down the Avon and mingled with the boundless ocean. The dog's narrative set off an outcry in the hall. Any eyes in a fine frenzy rolling from earth to heaven, calling it a tale told by a, you know, what signified, what's it called, etc. Our local stand up comedian, our great Gatsby, uprose and produced a blue pencil from his breast pocket, for he was an assistant editor with a local paper and pronounced airily, What you've just heard is nothing. I'm tired of you, Angrezi Wadas, ramming your Angrezi down my throat. Just the other day, my phone rang and I said, Liliji, kindly attend. It was a long distance call. I said, Pass it here. Yes. This is the head office of the Swatantra Times. How may I help you? The voice spoke in Amrezi, and I have sworn I won't ever speak in Amrezi. I said, aha, I know you. Who does not know you? Though for one moment, I thought it was our Vachanji. Namaskar, Shakspuri Sahab. I remember a parcel had come to us from Kasba Stratford, Vilayat. Yes, we have looked at it. Some parts of it need rephrasing, in my opinion. Now, this long speech, be, not be, yani ki hona hai, ya nahi hona hai, sawal ye hai. Okay for a film lyric, but meaning no expense, Shakspuri sahab, it's not working, not working, as we editors say. Rephrase, rephrase. I have taken the liberty of cutting out acts two and three. Also, wherever you have used the personal pronoun I, I have replaced it with this scribe. Any problem there? Be reasonable. There's a market to appease. Your kind of market might have like this rambling bubble, sorry, this sustained concentration if you like, but our kind of market, I was just saying this, when oh, the line went dead, emotional, these amateur pen pushers. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mamang Man, could we now invite uh, Professor Najibullah Azad, an eminent writer from Afghanistan? Hearty welcome, Professor Najibullah. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and namaste. Good afternoon. Uh, very happy to see you guys again. I'll skip the long introduction because uh, we, we don't have much time. I'll come to the fiction. Uh, uh, the subject matter uh, or the fiction is named My Dip. My Dip is written uh, on uh, one of our colleagues, a very good friend, a uh, SARC member who last time participated in a SARC event or festival in 2000. 17, uh, and he is no more with us, so uh, uh, it's been written on him. My dip. Today, 20 January 2018, was a sunny but very cold day, and I unusually woke up around 8 morning. Before I went to take shower, I thought to give a call to Azad, my best friend, and tell him, see, I have woken up early today. Don't blame me for waking up late at noon. Then I rethought giving a call would mean buying a headache. Anyways, filled, uh, filled the tub with hot water and laid down there for almost a half hour. After a, bre a breakfast, I dressed up, left for the office, which is the High Peace Council. Since my office is very close to where I live, I often make it by walk. On my way to the office, everyone seemed very comfortable, I looked at, but had no idea why I was not feeling okay. So I thought, I'm cold and shall make it on the other side of the road where the sun was, perfecting the pathways with his glamorous, warm and shining rays. Meanwhile, I bought some fried popcorns and peanuts to get me an extra inner heat and started eating them like a gorgeous baby doll girl dancing under an autumn tree after passing her exams. 
No, we were on the lunch table after a three-hour meeting for bringing peace and stability to the country. Although I am like all other Allah's or Islamic scholars, very hoodie, but in the in the thin, but the thin and long white Turkestani rice in a transparent crystal plate and rolled beef, non-fragile bowled was dearly inviting me to attack like I never had this before. First, I picked the white part of the beef full of fats and digest it. I thought life is too short. Don't let this fat go back. We'll work out for an extra hour in jam this evening. Around 3.30 after I prayed the evening, lift for home. As when I walked out of the office, felt even colder. This time I made it to this side of the road so I can hug the sun's rays like I had my bride on the first night. But I felt that the sun was badly yellow paled, showing only his existing but no job. I unwantedly felt that its dying yellow rays gives me the message of and hope, hopelessness of the piece we had been working on for a decade. I accidentally pulled out my mobile phone and dialed the number. Good morning, Mr. Philosopher, as I said. Me, I woke up at eight in the morning today with left, I answered. How and where are you? I asked. As usual in the office, but not good, since translating your column has killed me all over, as I'd say. Well, thank you, sir. Hey, listen, Mr. Poyan, the Afghan consular in Karachi, called me last night and invited us for a dinner tonight at the Continental. So take the dinner as your payment for the translation, I say it with a smile. Get the hell. You want to give me a party by someone else's pocket? Rahman Saib is on his way. I will call Poyan Saib too. You two come here. Forget the Continental. We will enjoy it here, as i said. Since Mr. Poyan had already invited other guests, so we made it to him. We were not done with the greetings yet that gunfires were started on the ground floor. In a scaring way, I called upon Azad about the gunfires. He, with his usual smiling tune, said, Didn't I tell you not to take in an open field? I'm serious, I said. He got serious this time and tried to call me and guided me what to do. Meanwhile, he said that he would inform the security forces. We had multiple communications during this time unless my phone got dead. We were in 402 room on the fourth floor. There was a dark brown wooden bed, five chairs and a table with the same color. The room's curtains were creating a scary storm in the situation. A scary dark silence occupied the surroundings. The only voice that was hitting our ears was the fear and terror. I could hear only frightening shouts and stepping sounds of two or three people at the corridor. All my senses were dreadful and I felt like I was watching a horror movie on a 3D cinema screen and every move was rising my hair. Incidentally, I got blind and my entire thinking power was paralyzed. But soon I understood that I had not got blind yet, but the electricity went off. We put our phones on silent mood. I unintentionally poured some water into a crystal glass. The sound of pouring water into the glass was like the earth crashed its waves in a stormy, frightening night. I tried to pick the glass and drink the water, but was not able to pick it. I randomly heard the shattering sound of the glass that was fallen down from my hand. The sound broke the 
dreading silence in our room and we and Harry put the bed and the table to the door so the terrorist could not enter. At this time, the terrorist opened a gunfire and made enough hole and door. They threw kinda petrolic grenade into the room. The room got fire with the terrific blast. I felt dizziness within seconds and my body started, started getting out of my brain's control. I tried my best, but body seemed to be as heavy and cold as the Hindukish mountain. It was not long that I felt myself attached to the ceiling. Though everything was on fire down on the floor and surrounding was occupied by the heavy smoke, yet I could see myself lying on the floor. This was the first time that I was screaming, but no one was hearing me. I was shocked that I am all well and attached to the ceiling. I could see myself on the floor at the same time. Soon I realized that I have got out of my body. The terrorist attack on our hotel finally ended at six in the morning after an 11, 11 hour fight. The sunrise, his rays were annoying me this time. I was taken to a mortuary and was put with other burnt bodies. They tried the post-mortem examination but failed. Some of my relatives in Kabul came to recognize my body, but failed so. Finally, the next day, Azad came, and I don't know how did he recognize me. I was put in a coffin and sent to Kandahar, my hometown. Finally, I was buried many writers, poets, politicians, friends, and relatives at the last time farewell and grave souls from the coffins holes fell since my body was badly burned my body started inflammation and pain unexpectedly I felt strange situation angels were arrived and now my summon was started after I was done I thought it only took a few minutes, but the angels told me that it had taken three years. Later, they offered me an opportunity. They said that they would send me back to the world of human. No one will be able to see me, but I could see everyone. They said, go see your family, friends, and relatives. And then see if you think you want to live in the human world again, we will give you a normal life, the one you had in the past. I took this opportunity. Then universities. My daughters might be among them. I did not recognize my home, it was quite changed. I did not see my red car at home. Anyways, first I walked into the, to my study room where I had collected thousands of books, but found only three cover. Excuse me, Professor Azad, there seems to be some internet disturbance. Uh, can you uh, hear me now? Uh, sorry to intervene, but there seems to be some internet disturbance. Uh, how is it now? Does it work? Okay, it's okay, but we will have to follow the time frame. Could we move on to uh, Sri uh, Subodh Sarkarji to listen to him? Sure, sure. Thank you.
I now invite uh, Mr. Subodh Sarkarji, distinguished poet, writer, and critic. Subodh, please unmute yourself. No, you aren't audible as yet. Yeah. Is it okay now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. fine. Please. Okay. Uh, first, I thank uh, Ajit Kaurji, the great ma mind behind this great event. She has been doing it every year, and this year it is uh, online. I thank others, those who are associated with this conference. And uh, I have been asked to, uh, to talk about my poetry. And I have decided to do one thing. I, I will just uh, talk about my poetry but with uh, just three examples from my poetry, from my works. Uh, just to get it done within 10 minutes. If not, I, I am not going to take 10 minutes. So I will get it done within 10 minutes, I hope. And uh, this is how I will connect the, the three poems that I will read at different um, stages uh, within 10 minutes. So I will connect with my life as I have been asked to talk about my poetry, my life. Um, I, I have been writing poetry for the last 40 years. And I have written, I have published 35 books in 40 years. And um, one new book is almost ready. It is going to be published due to COVID situation. It could not get published. So I have been writing all these books in Bengali, in Bangla. I have some books in English, but that's a different thing. That is mainly academic. But um, uh, as far as poetry is concerned, that I have made some, trans I have translated some of uh, the poems in Bengali and also some foreign poems into Bengali. And um, I am going to begin with a poem, the poem I wrote in 2006. 2006, you know what happened in Monipur. It was a terrible time in Monipur, a small, beautiful state in Northeast, and Mamangdai is here. Uh, Mamangdai has heard this poem before, I think. Uh, and uh, this poem I wrote about the mothers, uh, the 14 mothers who came down to street to, 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 to protest naked against the Indian army with this banner covering their, you know, thighs and upper portion, you know. The Indian army raped us. That was uh, internationally telecast and that was, you know, a headline all over the world. So that night, when I was writing this poem, I found that my mother was also, mother who died long ago, I thought that in a dream, I thought that my mother was standing with the 14 naked women, naked mothers, uh, protesting against the Indian army. So the poem is called Mothers of Manipur. Naked they stood up. The mothers of Manipur. My eyes are bored from their eyes. All that I speak is from them. From their music. Naked they stood up. The mothers of Manipur. Can the army and the police do anything they like? Nobody is allowed in the streets. Only smoke goes by. Nobody can speak up. No way to protest. Naked they stood up. The mothers of Manipur. Army jeeps move around under the sky. Army jeeps sing our national song. There is unbuttoning in one jeep. A girl reeled into the jeep. Should the girl go home? 
Should the girl die under the sky? Police have erased her name. What's her address? A village outside Impor. This is what happens every day. A girl is found unconscious, her younger sister missing. Only their scarves flutter from the trees. But in the month of July, the limit is passed. Naked they stood up, the breast milk givers. Let the world watch the veins in their chest. How do you feel when you see your own mother naked? As Assam rifles shut the door, shut the gates, I feel as I did in the womb. I feel the river Ganga streaming out hot. The mothers of Manipur redefined mothers. Where mothers walk naked in protest, colonels, Commanders, what did you do? Do you think your mom remains your mom? She's burning. She's burning. She's burning. Inside every mother, a mother, willing mother. Uh, this poem was translated by Christopher Merrill, the American poet. We sat together at uh, Iowa City at the University of Iowa, where I was teaching at that time as, um, as a visiting professor on Fulbright Fellowship. And I was also participating in uh, the international writing program, which is a very famous one all over the world. The writers all over the world joined there almost every year. Uh, this year it was not possible. But so I think, you know, uh, the second poem that I will uh, read. Uh, uh, it has that connect uh, with uh, with my wife, my wife who passed away, you know, in 2011, and she was uh, a poet in her own right, an eminent poet in her own right. It's a very short poem, uh, and I I had written a book of elegies uh, on her. Her name is Mollika Shendupko. And uh, the poem that I'm going to read is called After Mullika Died. So, very short one, just a few lines. You can say it is an elegy. After a walk for a thousand of years, today, I suddenly understood that man is an ant, eaten by an ant. After Holocaust, nuclear explosion, and gene mapping, I realized, trust me, I realized man is a caterpillar. After love and love making, man is some joy. I accepted the truth that man is but a moth in the universe with the burden of another universe on its little head. The third poem with which I will conclude is called where is the good place? I wrote this poem after the fall of Soviet Union. And this poem, when I was, when I got this poem published in, in a Bengali weekly, it was a very difficult time for me because in Bengal at that time to write uh, on the fall of Soviet Union as if there was no fall at all. It was very difficult for me to to go with this poem, uh, reading this poem out at different uh, places. So, but I chose to read this poem everywhere, wherever I was invited to read my poems. 
and um, here what what ashish nandji has said uh, with reference to the chinese poet you know uh, they figured out that he quoted he is absolutely right when i was writing this poem many poems like this one you know i was also trying to find my my space between the hunter and the hunted i i could not feel the freedom in between the space has called freedom and the freedom between the hunter and the hunted and uh, rather i felt that i was hounded about by certain people at that time the people in power at that time so the poem is called uh, where is a good place uh, it's it's a, it's a it's a dialogue between uh, between my son who was only 3 year old at the time uh, when the soviet union collapsed and uh, uh, the leftist in power and they were so powerful in west bengal at the time so it's a dialogue between the father and the son the son is only 3 year old yet to speak properly where is the good place when he got up from his nap my 3 year old son said papa will you take me to a good place surprised i looked at the 3 year old at 3 year old eyes 3 year old lips trickling drops of sweat i said go get the zoo the lions gotten very hungry the tiger has chased the deer he said no take me to a good place he went to the next room cried a bit came back with a tattered girl marks calendar and said we will take this grand grand part too by train by boat hey papa papa want to go to a good place when i took him to victoria he said no this is not good when i took him to the ganges he said it's only a river when i gave him ice cream he walked along feeling disgusted i took him home around 8 and saw tattered curl marks lying abandoned on the floor i told my son listen this grandpa said he would take us to a good place too that sunday there was no train no boat quiet for a moment thinking who knows what he began winning again i gave him a ball i gave him a robot i had him a ship right when i was wondering whether to give him a spanking he asked the old time big question hey papa tomorrow will you take me to a good place tomorrow Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Now I request uh, Mamang Man to conclude this session because now we have only three minutes at hand to end this session. Mamang Man, please. Yeah. Okay. I would just like to say uh, thank you to everyone. You know, it was very nice to listen to Professor Ashish Nandi also. talking about freedom and the difference between the hunter and the hunted that is going to last us a while you know and coming out of this uh, pandemic period i would also like to express my deepest respects and gratitude to madam ajit porji as always because she is always trying to in-